members HP to um, do the labs and now I'm on my Mac but so I was thinking about trying to do boot camp and I was reading up on it and it said it takes up a lot of space um, has anyone had experience with that because I have a MacBook Air and I have an external hard drive but I don't have much space on my um, the hard drive that's built in to the computer so I'm not sure what I should do to try to um, get GIS um, Ian and Alyssa, Alisa, you guys have had the most experience. I think the best thing would be to contact um, Scott Winslow and me. Just send me an email after class. What we've been doing for the people who've, who have Macs and have had trouble with the boot camp is assign you access to the lab computers. So we made all those computers in 201 available for you to VPN in through just the internet. So what it does is essentially you, you log in and it, it looks like you're sitting at a computer in 201. And you can oh, okay. software there. The thing is, I think you have to have a folder on the O drive to do all your work and then copy it from the O drive, like send it to me from the O drive. At whoever's doing this, can you guys update me on how you're submitting the- Yeah. It's right. We cannot use the USB on our computer because we're technically using their PC at the lab. So you got to save everything in the computer, in the old drive, and just use it from there. You can't access it from the computer anymore. So, Sierra, so I would just send it from while I'm using access on that computer? Yes. Save, when you save it, you you're send it to the old drive. You create a new folder under your name and everything you do on that computer will be saved on that folder, but you can't just transfer to a, to a hard drive or a USB because technically you're not really using your computer, using that computer. Mm -hmm. So remember here are the drives in the lab. I have access to them from my home. I'm not VPNed in or anything, but here's the N drive, O drive. So you would make a folder on here. David, can I open yours? See here. So here's David's and he's been working on the lab in there. So he may be somebody, I don't know if you're here. I can't see everybody. Um, he's not here. Oh yeah, you are. Hi, David. <laughs> I'm using you as an example. And who else is in here? You've been using this. Katrina, have you been using this? I have one in there too. Yeah. Yeah, I've got mine. Kazel. Yeah, that's what I thought. Can I open it? Yeah, go for it. So, so she's been, so you, you log in, you download that you, so the, this is just your folder and you have it on the O drive. So Siri, I'll just make one with your name, copy all the stuff. And so how's the timing been working? Cause we have tons of hours on there that haven't necessarily been used. Initially we said we'd assign you a four hour block and you just tell us when you want to log in and that's your four hours to do the work. But it, that way you like if he assigned 201 computer number one to two different people you wouldn't overlap but i don't think we have as much traffic as we anticipated so how's your time worked out yeah i think i have like a seven or eight hour block on thursdays which has been nice um and then i was able to get access for friday morning so i can follow along with lab while we're doing classes oh, okay so ian are you logged in now too on your friday time uh yeah i guess he gave me uh, all those times. Okay. Yeah. So you're able to access ArcGIS now during class because you're logged into the computer? Yeah, I think so. Let me see. I'm logged in, but um, I have to be logged in at both because when I try to do the Zoom through there, I can't do it because there's no microphone or video. No. There's no connection. Yes. So then I can use that, but then um, I can use mine and have that open and just come, go back and forth to it and just open that for the ArcGIS. I just started doing that today because I didn't have access that last Friday so I just did that and I just need to have both open. Okay so it's not a hundred percent I mean it's not like there's no there's no you know there's nothing it's not like us being all together <laughs> but it's what we have. Definitely not. <laughs> you know so so Sierra, I wouldn't bother trying to, at this point, going through the time and stress of potentially screwing up your Mac. <laughs> I would, I would, if you're, cause all you need is an internet connection and you can log in and, and the login process is pretty straightforward once you guys got it ironed out, right? Yeah. We just okay. So I'll just, 
So I just sent an email to Scott then. Yeah, and me and okay. tell yeah, CC me so I can. It doesn't matter. Do you have Scott? It's Scott Winslow at csulb.edu and tell him that you're in 481 and you have a Mac. Whatever, just tell him you need access to the lab. And give him some times. He wants to know four hour blocks of times or when, when you would prefer to, to, to uh, log in. So if you have a work schedule you're working around or school schedule, even on Saturdays and Sundays, it's fine. It just has to, it can't be after 10 p.m. because at 11 p.m. those computers wipe themselves, right? They do, they, they're on a, a, a schedule. So you can't, it, it has to end at 10 p.m. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you everybody for the, that feedback um, for, for their, input on how that's working. Any glitches we should be aware of in that access? Aside from some of the Mac people weren't able to get in initially, but I think we overcame that. Am I correct? Yeah, now um, I, I had a slot on, on Wednesday. I couldn't log in that day. Um, somehow it wasn't recognizing my username or something, but I, could, I talked to Scott and we kind of figure it out. It, it was pretty quickly. I think I did, I typed something wrong, but, um, but then because of that, and I told him I'm really behind on my last work. So he gave me all day today and I have time Saturday and Sunday as well. So I got a bunch of time that I can catch up on stuff. Okay. So that's available to everybody. I mean, even if you're, even if you're have it at home, you can still access that if you prefer to work up using the lab computers, because some of you have had issues with your home computers. Excuse yeah, some are pretty flexible with that, just adding more time if you need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so far it's worked so well. I mean, I know we only have three weeks left to the semester, so um, I don't know, you know whether more people are accessing it or not, but we have plenty of time, so please make use of it if that's something you wanna do. Okay, so for those of you, are you, um, it looks like everybody's done the raster priority or a number of you have, got, have caught up. Are there any, um, hang on a second, ah, save and close. Anything you would like me to go over from last week's lab? Basically last week was, really just delving a little bit more deeply into the DEM. So we started two weeks ago with Raster and I introduced Raster GIS. We brought in, a, just to recap, we brought in a DEM to ArcGIS two weeks ago. That was the Raster Priority Lab. We did a whole bunch of binary overlays where we queried that grid. We, um, we looked at the grid, we calculated slope, and then we queried the grid for greater than a certain elevation and it converted that continuous surface into a binary grid of zeros and ones. Ones met the criteria, zeros didn't. We did the same for slope. And then we brought a land use file in from Orange County and converted that to a raster based on an integer code that was in the attribute table. So we just jumped into raster using that example. And then last week I built on that a little bit more by having you find your own DEM. And then I talked more about terrain parameters and introduced how ArcGIS calculates slope and how we only have one, one algorithm available to us, even though there are numerous algorithms available to us for calculating slope. So I went over the slope calculation and would like you to understand that, how that's calculated and how it's possible to have slope percents that are greater than 100 because the angle of slope is degrees and the tangent for example, of a 45 degree angle is one. So one times 100 is 100%. So that's how a 45 degree angle can have 100% slope. So that's, I guess, what I spent three hours on in less than five minutes as a recap right now. Um, we brought that into ArcGIS. We learned how to get a DM. And then after last week's lab, I went back and um, I made some videos and I added them to the lectures. 
So you can go back and look at those because some people wanted some more help with that, those steps. So I loaded last week's um, Zoom. And then I had, I think I had problems with the lecture part. Did you, yeah. Anyway, there's last week's lecture and lab part. And then I made separate videos and put them to YouTube on projecting the, on defining an AOI, downloading a DEM, projecting the raster. It's so important to remember that every time you download data from the web, it's in Web Mercator. It's in a, it's in a geographic projection, so it's spherical. And if you ever want to do any work with the data, you have to project it. That's why projections are so important, projections, transformations. Um, so we'll do some more of that today. Well, I don't have a projection in there. I projected all the data that I'm going to show you today, Just, but my expectation is that you understand that. So when you project a raster, there's a separate toolbox. It's not, it's embedded in the data transformations, um, projections, data management, projections and transformations in ArcGIS, but there's a separate toolbox for projecting a raster. So you have to access that separately. Um, okay, so that was my quick, quick review. And we're gonna continue on becoming masters of the raster today. Any questions about that, where we are? So today what I decided to, you guys are so quiet. I'm like, this is what I'm looking at, just so you know. <laughs> Can you see that? So a high class, <laughs> high boxes of people. I miss I you in real, person, in real life. <laughs> so weird talking to boxes. Um, okay. I guess I should put my chat on so I can see if you're, you can see the chat. All right, let me situate myself for a minute. Bear with me. And when you're watching this video, you can put it on like 87 R RPM or whatever it is and skip over this part. I just made my screen like do wonky things. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to, if you're, I, don't, I can't see the chat yet. So hang on, I'm trying to get the chat to show up. Now it's not letting me see my chat. More chat, there it is, okay. Okay, so let's move on. So today what I want to do with you is build on what we've been doing and that's my sort of MO is building on what we've been doing and um, re and reinforcing it that way by, sorry, I can't get this box to go back to normal now, sorry. Now I'm looking at like, I can't, I can't see who I'm looking at. <laughs> Technical difficulties, let me. I don't know what happened. See, I can't grab the, the corners. Here we go. There we go. Sorry. All right. Two screens. Now I'm good. We're going to become masters of the raster. We can, I should just like delete that, those last three minutes in the video, just fast forward through it. Okay. So I'm building off of where we've jumped off of reinforcing and enhancing. That's the plan. So the beauty of raster is it's a completely different data structure that allows us to do things that we just can't do in vector. And those things include uh, those overlay analyses and suitability analyses. And there's a whole toolbox related to overlay analyses that we're gonna go through and learn today. So before we did the binary overlay, which was just map algebra, and you should have a map algebra, understand how to do it, where to access it, the raster calculator, we converted the grids to binary grids, zeros and ones, add them together. Very simple suitability analysis that we refer to as a binary suitability analysis because it converts the grids into zeros and ones. It's just binary data. But ArcGIS has a whole toolbox here, the overlay toolbox. And we are going to go through these three different types of overlays that are only available in raster GIS weighted sum, weighted overlay, and fuzzy overlay. So what I'm gonna do in the notes here is briefly give some background 
and I've designed a lab um, specifically for this where we're going to go through each each one. So I'm going to start with weighted sum and weighted overlay, and then I'm going to do the we're going to jump into ArcGIS, follow along, and then I'll come back to the slides and talk about fuzzy overlay, and then we'll jump back into the assignment and do the fuzzy overlay, and I'll explain why those are are different. So what weighted overlay does is it takes the binary a step further. So it, first of all, what we do, before it was just zeros and ones, and in our raster calculator, you could approximate what a weighted sum does. What a weighted sum does is just assign a global weight to that grid. So say, for example, reflect back to last week, or two weeks, what did we do last week, right? We had, or two weeks ago, the raster priority, that's probably more familiar to many of you because that's the one that you'll probably have gotten through, the majority of you've been through. So we queried the elevation for greater than 250 and it became zeros and ones. And we queried the slope for greater than um, a certain percent, I can't remember what it was, and it became zeros and ones. And we queried the, the, um, the land use for anything that was residential and it became zeros and ones. And then we added those zeros and ones together and anything that was a three met all three criteria, a two and a one. We went off the grid, so to speak, sorry, you know, I can't help it. The puns are always intended. Um, and, and used raster calculator and weighted those so that we could get the qualitative information out of it, like which were the combinations of twos, et cetera. But for the most part, we had the ones, twos and threes. So what weighted sum does is just apply an overall weight to each of those input grids. So say you thought that elevation is worth five, is five times more important than slope. You would multiply the entire um, elevation binary grid by five. And say you thought that um, slope was three times, you would multiply the grid by three times. You could do that in raster calculator, but ArcGIS has a separate um, tool called weighted sum where you can do that. The key, the Thing that's more enhanced about these is that before we put them into these overlay operations, you can rank, you work with ranked grids. So instead of just being zeros and ones, they're ranked like in a range of one to four, like one being least, whatever the criteria is, hazardous, um, and four being the highest, whichever way you, it's not, if you flip it, one being the, the worst and four being the best, as long as you're consistent within all the grids that you include in that, it's okay. So you rank your grids first. So you have a set of grids where instead of zeros and ones, it's one to five. One being the least of something, five being the most, assume. Then the next one is one to fives, one to fives. You can have it one to 10, you can have it one to four, you can have it one to three, as long as all the grids that you include in the ranking are all the same amount like you all, if, if you choose to have rankings of one to five all of the input grids have to be one to five if you choose to have one to ten all of the inputs need to be one to ten so you rank your grids and then you can apply this this weighting to it so we could have done that using a weighted sum we, we could have done that in just raster calculator but there are these tools where we're going to do that and then apply some more sophisticated analyses to them. So the first thing to rank your grids is you need to reclassify them. So there's a tool called reclassify and it just takes the old values and puts new values in there based on whatever scheme you've identified as what you think is low, medium, and high, et cetera. So we'll do that. Um, so first you want to determine the rankings. And here uh, I have all of these are based on continuous surfaces. So let's just think about, so it's taking continuous surfaces and ranking them. The thing that we can do with the other, um, with weighted overlay and weighted sum is also include discrete, like our vegetation and soils, and which we're, we're gonna do today. So here, let's harken back to our continuous surfaces. So we have slope. So say whatever the question is, um, these are our input grids. We think that slopes that are 20% and higher are one, anything that's zero to five and 15 to 20 would be a, a rank of two, anything that's five to 10 would be a rank of three, anything that's 10 to 15 would be a rank of four. So whatever, I, unfortunately I don't know, this, I don't have on the top of my head what a spatial question is that this is, maybe this is some kind of hazard analysis and, and these are the classes that you assign to each of these. So this is best, this is worse, 
And then for aspect, you, whoops, you can rank your aspect in these ranges. So as you compartmentalize your input continuous surfaces. So instead of making them binary zeros and ones, they're now ranked into classes of zero to four, one to four, I mean, based on whatever you think is low, medium, next, and highest for your, for your classification scheme. Here's distance to road. So as long as you're consistent in what's best and worst, or worst and best, depending on which way you go, um, you classify each of your inputs into these. So now these are all reclassified. Instead of being a continuous surface of slope, the slopes are now ones, twos, threes, and fours. The aspects are now ones, twos, threes, and fours. So you have your input grids, instead of being zeros and ones, are ones, twos, threes, and fours. And then you bring those into your, your rank, your suitability, um, your overlay operations. So here's, for example, weighted sum. So weighted sum, so assume that we've classified all of our four grids. We have four grids, and now instead of zeros and ones, they're in ranges of one to four because we've used reclassify, reclassify, to reclassify them. So now we have four grids of zeros, or in this case, we have three grids of ranked grids. Now we throw those grids, slope rank, veg rank, and soil rank in, and we assign weights to them. So say we think slope is twice as important as everything else, you put, you change this number in here, and then it essentially multiplies the um, the entire grid by a two or by a 15, if you think it's 15 times more important, however, whatever you put in there. So let's think about this. Um, what weighted sum would do is say all, say you have three inputs and they're all in ranges, ranks, let's say zero to five. I'm sorry, one to five, because that's what we're going to do in the lab. So you have soils in ranks of one to five, vegetation, one to five, slope now one to five. So if you just did a basic, all things are equal, the highest value you could possibly have is a 15 because you're adding grids that are one to five together. If the highest cells in all of those overlap, all the fives overlap in co-located locations, the highest value would be a 15 and the lowest value could be a one, one to 15. If you then multiply those by something, so say you multiply one of them by a two in this example, then the, one of them is the highest value is a 10 and the other two are five. So the highest values you could have in that grid are 20. So the, your suitability would range from one to 20. So that's what weighted sum does. It's very simple. It's another, but it's a, you, could, a, you could do this in raster calculator, but it has its own tool in the overlay analysis. So that's weighted sum. Weighted overlay is a little bit more complex. So what it allows us to do, and I know you can't see this, but we're gonna jump into the exercise. Um, what weighted overlay allows us to do is throw in our grids. And it's if you have grids that haven't been previously ranked, you can put an evaluation scale in there and rank, rank them. Like it takes the old value and you rank them in here. But since we're ranking our grids before we throw it into weighted overlay, We'll tweak it a little bit. So weighted overlay is a little bit more um, complex than weighted sum. And it allows you to assign a percent influence. So instead of weighting something three times, it said you can say, well, I think soils is 25% influence and vegetation is 35% influence and soils is 15% um, influence. As long as all of the grids that you have in there add up to 100% influence, you're good to go. So it scale, it takes your ranked grids, it scales them by the percent influence, and your output is still a range within the ranges of the ranks that you've initiated, like say it's one to five, so your output's still one to five, but each of the inputs have been scaled and weighted accordingly. So that's weighted overlay. I know it's kind of hard to conceptualize just from a PowerPoint, and the best um, thing to do is, is do it and for me to show you. So to that end, we're going to, go into ArcGIS and I'm gonna show you weighted overlay and we'll do that part of the lab. So before I do that, I wanna just conceptually and, and have you think about, you know, beyond the button. So ArcGIS gives us these tools. We have weighted sum, we have weighted overlay, we have fuzzy overlay and we have binary overlays. You could do suitability analysis four different ways. You can have so many different assumptions like, so Casey might think that fire hazard is contributed by these factors. And Danielle may think that they're contributed by these factors. There's 17 of you, 21 of you, 15, however many are in the class today. You each could have different 
conceptualizations and have different outputs based on what you assign as your assumptions and weights. So it's important to think that even though you push the button and you have, this is the fire hazard in the Malibu area, just make sure that you're always communicate what the basis is for that assumption so that you communicate clearly how you derive that output. That's good science, it's repeatability and making sure that you're clear about your assumptions. Okay, so we're gonna delve into weighted sum and weighted overlay in the lab. So what I'd like you to do is hopefully it won't take too much time, is go to Beachboard. I should have had you do this at the beginning. I apologize. I just loaded this. Go to Dropbox. And go to, I should have done this. I should have done this when I sent you guys the link. Oh, geez. All right. Um, go to the folder for overlay and just download the data. I'm gonna put the OneDrive link in the chat. See how that works. So you can go to the chat and copy and paste that link and download it from there if it's faster. See if that works. And I did record a video of this whole first part. I didn't get to a video of the fuzzy overlay. So when we get to the fuzzy overlay, um, I will, I'll make a separate video from the Zoom. And um, right now, actually, I'll stop this recording and start it up again when we get into ArcGIS so that we have separate recordings for the different parts of today. So why don't I, I'm gonna start ArcGIS. How are you guys doing on the downloading? Silence. I'm trying to find it. And because you're familiar with Model Builder, I just decided not, I decided last week we did the steps outside of Model Builder and then put them in Model Builder. This time, um, we're just gonna just jump right into Model Builder and do everything in there and use Model Builder to explore our results. So while you're waiting, I'm going to introduce the data. So. Um, I've given you a folder, you don't have the instructor part, but you have an output folder that should be empty. A resources folder, let me go here. Yeah, this resources student overlay. Mm -hmm. In the overlay folder, the resources just has two, um, two documents that I used to base this lab on. This is, shows you how complex fire analysis can be. So here, let me just show this to you because I think it's really cool how they did their spatial model. I'm such a geek, whoops. Um, I don't know why I did that. So here's a wildfire hazard analysis. I don't know how to get that off. So it can be very complex. Wildfire is ex exceedingly, excessively complex. So just appreciate that the labs that I'm giving you are very simple, but that they are based on ways that we do things. So here's just the fire NATO potential in this, la in this article. The fire NATO potential is based on elevation, slope, aspect, and fuel. So we're not too far off. Ours I'm using today are for the fire hazard in weighted overlay. I'm giving you soils, vegetation, because I wanted to, I use this as an opportunity to introduce you to soils data and vegetation data. Um, and we've already done slope and aspect, so we've got a sense of the, and fuel. So we're not too far off, but there's all sorts of different ways. And look at how they did their spatial model. They <laughs> have their different layers, and they're, they're use pictures. And then this is a weighted overlay. So what they've done is weight these different aspects of this model. Again, this fire NATO potential is only one part of their model. So their fire NATO potential is somewhere in here and that's weighted certain percentages. So they have evacuation potential, critical infrastructure, human capital, fire suppression, fire combustibility. And so they weight them different percentages, 
2042-38 to come up with their wildfire susceptibility index. So this article is in there for you just to give you some more context and background on the complexity of uh, fire hazard, fire susceptibility modeling. And then here is fuzzy logic, uh, just some background on where I, some more background when we get to the fuzzy logic. I took this, uh, I, I took a screenshot of this in the lecture when we get to that point. So that's what's in the resources folder. I'm killing time hoping that you have the data now. Okay. Everybody have the data? So you have that. Um, that's in the resources student is the data and outputs where we're gonna save the data. So I actually already projected this for you. So this is the Malibu DEM from last week. So you should be familiar with it. Does everybody have this? Are you still downloading? I was able to download it, but I'm still just following along. Okay. All right, I'm gonna stop this recording and I'm gonna start again. Um, so we have a separate one for this part of the lab. So hang on, bye.